Arriving from Canada by bomber, Colonel Ralston, Lieutenant General Stewart, Chief of General Staff, and Mr. C.D. Howe were greeted by Mr. Vincent Massey. The first visit of the minister's lightning tour of the Canadian Army was to units of the 2nd Division, who had been engaged in the Dieppe raid. After the troops had swung proudly past the saluting base, Colonel Ralston talked to many of the battle-scarred young veterans, gathering first-hand information. At CRU, the minister certainly learned the ropes. At an artillery demonstration, light ack ack crews showed speed and skill, while 25-pounders blasted away at distant targets. Wounded men in Canadian hospitals, grim reminders of the heavy casualties of Dieppe, were cheered by the minister's words. In Scotland, Colonel Ralston saw the important work being done by the Forestry Corps. He talked to soldiers who, instead of rifles, carried axes and saws and peavies. While with the 1st Division, he saw the 3rd Brigade attacked with tanks under cover of heavy mortar smoke. After the demonstration, he inspected the West Nova Scotia's famous 1st Div unit from the Blue Nose province. And then to the 3rd Division, where the minister inspected units of the 9th Highland Brigade, including the massed pipe bands of the three battalions. On to the 1st Army Tank Brigade, where he saw an impressive demonstration of Canada's armored might. Squadron after squadron of heavy Churchills were drawn up in battle array on the down. At the 5th Div, the Skirl of Pipes welcomed the minister to the Cape Breton Highlanders. For this was Colonel Ralston's former unit, the old 85th, whom he commanded in the last war. The last item on the crowded program was a flying visit to units of the newly arrived 4th Division. And so Colonel Ralston left for Canada, knowing that the Canadian Army is ready, willing and able for whatever tasks may lie ahead. kind of competition, there was riding for skill where points were given for control, and riding for spills when Canadian and British dispatch riders raced over a tricky course at high speed. And then there were field events, such as the erection of poles to carry signal wires, for this was a test of skill at arms between signalers of the 12th Corps and 1st Canadian Corps. The events were tackled in a real sporting spirit, with Canadian and British signalers matching their skill in using the arms with which they fight the enemy. And in a close finish, the Canadians came out on top by a score of 468 to 452. The Canadian infantryman is well used to the rigors of battle drill and assault training. But in World War II, it's not only the infantry who have to do the fighting. No troops can consider themselves completely out of the battle area. And so the 3rd Divisional Special Training School takes men from what used to be considered the non-combatant arms and turns them into frontline soldiers. These men are from the supply and transport and petrol and ammo companies of the RCASC, from the field parks and workshops of the Ordnance Corps, from divisional engineers and signals, medicals from the field ambulances, but fighting men, every one of them, imbued with the Canadian Army's spirit of attack. started clearing ground for a new airport for the RCAF. It was a mammoth job, and it had to be done quickly. One of the chief obstacles to the expansion of the Canadian Army's vital air component was the shortage of air drones. So General McNaughton set the Royal Canadian Engineers to work. To help the sappers came detachments from the Forestry Corps, the Ordnance Corps, and drivers from the RCASC. Heavy Canadian and American equipment was kept working 18 hours a day, six days a week 
and there was no time off for tea. Five short months after work was started, the Army had done its job in record time. The huge airdrome was ready to be formally handed over to the RCAF. Chief figures in this ceremony included Air Chief Marshal Courtney, Air Marshal Edwards, Major General Hertzberg, the Army's Chief Engineer, and Lieutenant General McNaught. I'm very happy to be here today <laughs> and to acknowledge also, as General Hertzberg has done, the very wonderful cooperation in this whole matter which has been extended to us uh, by the Air Ministry and all those who, uh, who work uh, in that ministry under the direction of uh, Air Chief Marshal Courtney. Air Marshal Edwards, accepting the aerodrome on behalf of the RCAF, declared it one of the finest in England and a magnificent achievement. Meanwhile, 12 Mustangs were circling the field in tight formation. And as they landed on the smooth, wide runways, they symbolized the striking cooperation between the Canadian Army and the RCAF. History was made when senior officers of the Coldstream Guards joined with Canadians to welcome their allied regiment, the Governor General's Foot Guards. Brigadiers Burns and Phelan greet Lieutenant Colonel Rick, the officer commanding. Then the foot guards marched off to their new quarters to train for the day when they'll add to the glorious achievements of the old CEF Iron Second. With the band of the Grenadier Guards playing them into the station, the Canadian Grenadier Guards arrived. In this historic moment was shown the keen interest taken by the senior regiment of the Empire in its Canadian namesake. Guards officers waited while the unit detrained and fell in on the station platform. Major H.G. Griffith was greeted by Lieutenant Colonel Piler, officer commanding, and Brigadier Phelan, who formerly commanded the regiment and later the Canadian Brigade of Guards. Like the foot guards, the Canadian Grenadiers are now an armored regiment and form part of the 4th Division. Gone for the duration are the Busby and Scarlet Tuning, replaced by battle dress and the grease and sweat of the tank soldier. Somewhere in the future lie great names to be added to the battle honors already won. Names like Hill 70, Passchendaele, Canal du Nord, Vimy. Welcome indeed to the Canadian Army in England are these two proud units with their proud tradition. While the Royal Standard flew high above Buckingham Palace, a patient crowd assembled outside the gates. For the word had gone round that the men of Dieppe were to receive their decorations from the king. Finally they appeared, the soldiers, sailors and airmen, whose deeds on that fateful day had won them recognition. Major General Roberts, who commanded the military forces, received the DSO, as did Brigadier Mann, self-styled backroom boy. So did Air Commodore Cole, Royal Australian Air Force. Captain Porteous, VC. The Canadian VC, Colonel Merritt, SSR, is now a German prisoner. Amongst the many Canadians was Sergeant Thurgood, MM, Royal Regiment. Privates Thrussell and McKellar, SSR, both received military medals. Private Mayor, BCM, Corporal Carl, MM, and Lance Sergeant Mizar, all Essex Scottish. Corporal Dow, FMR, and Sergeant Dixon, Essex Scottish, military medals. Second from the right, Private McQuaid, MM, RHLI. Captain Wilkinson, SSR, Military Cross. On the right, Sergeant Dubuque, MM, the FMR. Lieutenant Kavanaugh, Queen's Own Cameron's Military Cross. On the left, Lance Corporal Fisher, 2nd Dib 6. On the left, Private Haggard, DCF, SSR. Private Labret, FMR, Military Medal. In the center, Private Leo Filio, Military Medal. Captain Brown, Padre of the Camerons, Military Cross. Lance Corporal Vergette, RHLI, Military Medal. RSM Dean, RHLI, Military Medal. In the center, Corporal Graham, RHLI, DCM. On the right, Sergeant Mundy, SSR, Military Medal. Captain Carswell, RCA, Military Cross. CQMS Marsh, Black Watch, Military Medal. Major Kennedy, Essex Scottish, Military Cross. Lance Corporal Gilbert, 2nd Div 6, Military Medal. 
Lance Corporal Huppy, Cameron's military medal. Lieutenant Ewaner, RCE Military Cross. Signalman Ray, 6th Brigade Headquarters, Military Medal. Captain Lorangier, FMR, Military Cross. And many others whom our busy cameramen were unable to photograph. Heroes all, these men. Heroes who helped to write a glorious page of history. usage wears out vehicles. Careless filling wastes petrol. Use a funnel. Low pressure shortens tire life. Keep them filled. Paper is precious. Save it for the waste basket. Get economy minded. Remember, every scrap counts. 